Okay, let's talk about mitral valve disorders. The mitral valve is the one that has two cusps, and it is between the left atrium and left ventricle. Um, they All valves have chordae tendinae, or strands of just fibrous tissue that help to anchor them down and allow for them to stretch and um, return. Um, they kind of work like they're muscles within these um, cusps, okay? Um, there's three possible problems that can happen with the mitral valve. It can become very rigid um, or have stenosis like we talked about with the aortic valve. So it can be really, really hard and narrow. Um, it can have regurgitation also like we talked about with the aortic valve um, where it causes backflow between the atrium and ventricle too much. Um, where we want it to be one directional, it can backflow both directions, or it can have prolapse, and that's where it's just really, really floppy. You will end up having regurgitation as a result of having a prolapsed valve, um, but it's just really floppy. Okay, this is the most common problem that we have with the mitral valve. All right, so stenosis, again, like we said, it just, it's really, um, you know, hard and narrow, and it doesn't allow the left ventricle to fill completely because all of the blood is going to back up into the left atrium because the blood can't push through that really, really hard, narrowed opening. Um, it can follow rheumatic carditis and worsen with each recurrence of endocarditis. So if they've had any other kind of infectious or inflammatory disorder within the heart, we're going to go ahead and start monitoring them for mitral valve stenosis. The cusps are going to stick together, just form a really thick, rigid scar, um, you know, where the cusps are supposed to form together. Um, the chordae tendinae will then just fuse, shorten, become rigid, so it's not allowing for that stretch and recoil that we want for there to be. Okay. Um, as a result of the chordae tendinae dysfunction, the valve doesn't open um, and close properly, and it doesn't empty of all the blood that we want it to, right? Um, so the blood is going to pool within the left atrium, clots are going to form, it can then lead to arterial emboli, which is what a moving clot, right, which can then cause very many problems. Um, the left atrium enlarges and fills, and then the pressure from the overfilling causes the backflow um, of the blood backwards into the lungs, which then we're going to start noticing some increased pressure in the lungs. We'll hear some crackles and um, gurgles and everything within the lungs. Um, the patient could end up then having pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary edema. The right side of the heart is then going to have to work so hard um, to try to compensate for the blood backing up from the left side of the heart. Um, and you could then end up having right-sided heart failure as a result, which then eventually can back up into the rest of the body. Not good. The heart is a circuit, right? It, it flows in one direction, and so if it flows backwards at all from anything having a problem, like with this mitral stenosis, there's a problem. The blood flow can't go in the one direction that it needs to go, and so it's going to back up and cause a lot of problems. If it's causing a problem on the left side of the heart, like it is with the mitral valve, eventually it's going to cause a problem on the right. <clears throat> Signs and symptoms with mitral stenosis, you're going to notice changes in the heart sounds um, first and foremost, okay? Firstly, you'll probably hear a muffled S1 sound, so that love is going to be really, really muffled and, and kind of dense sounding, okay? And that's, um, you know, just as a result of just the uh, malformation of that cusp, those cusps, I'm sorry, of that valve. Um, the, merm the cusps can become um, fused or calcified, and that then can sound like a murmur. Um, but just listen closely because you might start noticing some abnormal sounds when you auscultate. Um, the patient is going to feel pretty fatigued, um, maybe some dyspnea, some trouble breathing, with, especially with slight exertion, um, whenever the patient tries to get up and move around and, and do anything. Um, the symptoms become disabling, typically 10 years after, um, after they have the mitral stenosis, um, because, you know, this condition worsens over time, and especially with stress, you're going to notice more and more signs and symptoms. Um, they also might end up having some tachy dysrhythmias, which might lead to some palpitations, which they might be able to feel. Um, some pulmonary hypertension with um, shortness of breath at night, maybe some crackles to auscultation. You want to ask them to cough and cough up their sputum, and when they do, if it's pink and frothy, that's letting us know that there's some blood that has backed up into the lungs. They might have a low systolic blood pressure, and that's just because of the 
decrease cardiac output because if you remember from our very first um, set of slides with cardiac, um, systole is whenever that left ventricle contracts and causes the cardiac output, right? And so if that left ventricle doesn't have the amount of blood that it needs to be able to push out the amount of cardiac output that it needs to, then the systolic number is going to be much lower, right? Go back and review this if this doesn't make sense to you or ask questions in class time, okay? But um, so they'll have a low systolic blood pressure. If the right side does end up becoming affected, remember that I said they might end up with some jugular vein distension or generalized edema, maybe even um, some facial flushing as a result of the blood backing up into the rest of the body. To diagnose this, we need to get a chest x-ray, and that's going to show us an increased size of the left atrium, and we're going to see that mitral valve calcification. Um, an echocardiogram is going to show us just decreased movement of those mitral cusps. Um, an EKG is going to show us a notched P wave, um, and that shows it here. Remember, the P wave is the very first one, okay? And so this P wave, which is talking about atrial um, atrial waves here, you're going to notice that it's notched, and that's just showing us that um, the atrium is taking longer to depolarize and it's just increasing in size and it's not functioning properly, okay? You don't need to remember the specifics of this. I just want you to know that that P wave is talking about our atria and it's malfunctioning if we see any notches or grooves or anything in that wave, okay? Um, to treat it, we want to give them some antibiotics just to prevent any infections um, and treat any infections that might have caused this. Um, aspirin to help prevent clot formation, anticoagulants again to prevent clot formation, and then we might need to do that percutaneous balloon valvuloplasty. Um, we talked about it with aortic stenosis, and it's again where they insert the wire, here it is here, with a deflated balloon, and then they inflate the balloon whenever they are within um, or between those cusps of the valve, just to help stretch them open um, and open up that um, avenue for the blood to travel through. All right, let's talk about mitral valve regurgitation really fast, um, and then I'll let you go for this um, set of slides. So mitral valve regurgitation, this is, you know, where we have the backflow of the blood. It's not one directional anymore. It's flowing backwards and forwards, and a lot of times it is um, associated with mitral valve prolapse, which we'll look at here in a minute. Um, and it's linked a lot of times to damage to the papillary muscles um, just after a myocardial infarction, so after a heart attack. It can develop after a balloon valvuloplasty if it's stretched too much and it's caused too much of an opening. The blood is then allowed to regurgitate backwards, which then also decreases the cardiac output. So we kind of took one problem, tried to fix it, and made a different problem. So we need to pay close attention whenever we're doing that procedure. Basically, the valve is not closing properly, and the blood is able to just flow backwards and forwards. Um, and the, the blood will then leak backward into the left atrium during systole, which is supposed to be pushing out. It's leaking backwards. And then it, um, it just slightly seeps and leaks into that left ventricle um, during atrial distally, which we don't want it to do because, remember, during each contraction, so let's say we have systole, it's supposed to push the blood out, right, and then close right back so that the atria are allowed to fill. Well, whenever we have regurgitation, it might push back some and then it's allowed to regurgitate, but then it never fully closes either so that the atria never fully fill, and so it leaks into the um, left ventricle, and so there's not that good forceful movement every single time like we want it to be. Um, the heart is going to compensate then by increasing its own size and allowing the blood to just kind of pull and, <clears throat> you know, the left ventricle is just not able to push that blood out and so it just kind of collects blood. Um, if regurgitation occurs rapidly like a swooshing sound and the heart can't compensate, um, the patient can go into um, shock and pulmonary congestion because the blood is not pushing out and our bodies need that to function. So that means the brain's not getting blood, the kidneys, the liver, nowhere in your body is getting blood, right? Past the heart. And so it's all pooling, the patient goes into shock, pulmonary congestion, they could eventually die from this. Um, the signs and symptoms of it, they're going to have some chronic fatigue and maybe some shortness of breath. They might be able to feel palpitations, a diminished S1 sound again. You might hear an S3, which is just an additional heart sound. Go online and listen to these, okay, so you know. But that's an impending sign of heart failure whenever we hear an S3, all right. Um, they probably will have some hypertension, some tachycardia because the heart's trying to pump out some blood, and a loud murmur. 
To diagnose it, we want to get an echocardiogram. It's going to show the changes structurally within the heart. And again, the chest x-ray shows an enlarged chamber size. Um, when we say chambers, we're talking about the ventricles and the atria. To treat it, we want to give them some ACE inhibitors just to reduce the preload. Some digoxin, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. All of these control the tachycardia within the heart to try to slow it down and just get the heart back on track. We do want to give prophylactic antibiotics because that blood is pooling. We're trying to prevent any further um, infections. We might need to do an intraaortic balloon pump. <coughs> Excuse me. And that um, is going to inflate during diastole just to help pump the blood through the heart and then deflates during systole. This is something that I just want you to know that it's an option. You don't need to know everything about it, but it will detail it more in your book if you'd like to learn about it. Um, an angioplasty is something that they do. It's a surgical procedure and it just helps to repair um, the valve's leaflets or cusps. All right, so here's mitral valve prolapse. Like I said, this can cause regurgitation and it's just where the cusps are floppy. They just are not firm at all. Not only are they not closing, but they are just floppy everywhere. Um, this is the leading cause of mitral valve regurgitation. And it is more common in young women. It's very bizarre because typically young women do not have heart issues except for mitral valve prolapse. So it's something that once a woman reaches her mid-20s or so, we want to start looking for signs and symptoms of this which if you start noticing palpitations or fatigue or angina, which is chest pain, that's not related with exertion, like if they run three miles. We expect some mild discomfort, don't we? But otherwise, they shouldn't have any heart pain. Um, and a lot of times in these younger women, you'll start noticing some prolonged chest pain and you're wondering what's going on with them. Potentially, they have mitral valve prolapse. You're also going to notice some shortness of breath, maybe rapid irregular heart rate, some lightheadedness, maybe even some anxiety from this um, condition. To diagnose it, we're going to listen and we'll hear a click, okay? I don't know how else to describe it other than a click, and that's exactly what it sounds like. Try to find the sound again online. Um, you also might hear a murmur, which is that swooshing sound, um, but it disappears whenever they squat down, okay? Somebody ask a question about this on Blackboard because I want to demonstrate for you what I'm talking about when they do the movements and everything um, to change the heart sound. Um, the echocardiogram is going to show just abnormal movement of the valve leaflets um, during systole, meaning um, it's not it's not opening and closing; it's just flopping around. Okay. Um, the EKG is essentially normal. You're not really noticing anything on the rhythm strip. To treat it, we're going to give them some digoxin, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, antiplatelets again, just to help prevent, again, clot formation. Um, some anti-anxiety medication, because sometimes anxiety can bring on um, worsening of the condition. Um, we also want to eliminate caffeine, just to help prevent tachycardia in this patient, just to help regulate the heart rate and everything. Okay, so here's some discussion group questions. We're going to talk about these in class, but if you want to go ahead and prepare, here they are. Um, all right. I will see you soon when we talk about other things, but um, that's it for this slide presentation. Bye.